broken into your home, violated your holy temple, left a pile of rubble. They've served up the corpses of your servants as carry-on food for birds of prey, through the bones of your holy people, out to the wild animals to gnaw on. They've dumped out their blood like buckets of water. Their bodies were left to rot, unburied, or nothing but a joke to our neighbors. Graffiti scrawled on the city walls. How long do we have to put up with this, God? Do you have it in for us for good? Will your smoldering rage never cool down? If you're going to be angry, be angry with the pagans who care nothing about you or your rival kingdoms who ignore you. They're the ones who ruined and wrecked and looted the place. Don't blame us for the sins of our parents. Hurry up and help us. We're at the end of our rope. You're famous for helping. God, give us a break. Your reputation is on the line. Pull us out of this mess. Forgive us for our sins. Do what you're famous for doing. Don't let the heathen get by with their sneers. Where's your God? Is he out to lunch? Go public and show the godless world that they can't kill your servants and get by with it. Give groaning prisoners a hearing. Pardon those on death row from their doom. You can do it. Give our jeering neighbors what they've got coming to them. Let their god taunts boomerang and knock them flat. Then we, your people, the ones you love and care for, will thank you over and over and over. We'll tell everyone we meet how wonderful you are, how praiseworthy you are. Each week in this series, you've been kind enough to text a response to either a question or a statement. Before we do that this morning, however, I'd like to give you a definition of a word that is central to our conversation today, but that we don't use very often. I just want to make sure we're all together on its meaning. The word is lament. Lament. Here's a dictionary definition of the word lament. To feel, show, or express grief, sorrow, or regret. To mourn deeply. That's lament. So, as the QR code appears on the screen, what I would like to ask you is if you would do this. If you're willing to point your camera at the QR code and and follow it to where it leads you, and then respond to this statement. God, today I deeply lament, and then fill in the blank. God, today I deeply lament, and then fill in the blank. Something that is not right with the world, something that is not right with your world. What is it that you brought with you this morning into worship that is a deep lament, a cause for deep mourning? We don't do that very well, do we? When we come to church, we're accustomed to singing worship and praise, and that is as it should be. That's a biblical discipline, to worship and to praise God. But there's another reality that in ancient Israel was also communal, and that was lament, mourning and grieving over something about the worshiper's world or the community's world might interest you to know that if you take the Seventh-day Adventist hymnal and you look up in the topical index, you can find all kinds of themes about which we sing hymns. You can find praise there and worship, adoration. You can find mission there. You can find church there, Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, God the Father. You can find many different topics and themes about which we sing. But when you look for lament, it's missing. It's not there. That's not true for every community or even every Adventist community. Our African-American brothers and sisters have long known how to express, express profound lament in their worship. Have you listened to the songs, listened to the, the, the music of the Negro spirituals? 
and what they have to say, sometimes I feel like a motherless child a long, long way from home. Swing low, sweet chariot, and take me home. Jordan River is chilly and cold. My home is on the other side. Time and again, the music of their song is that of lament, growing out of the experience that they have had. And yet, for many of us, we don't lament in such fashion. There isn't a song to express that, which sets us up in an interesting way. Because what it means is when we come into church, if our heart is filled with joy, if we're at peace with God, at peace with the world, and then we begin to sing praise, we can stand and sing it with joy and integrity. But if we have come in stooped and bowed under the burden of mourning, then when it's time to sing, we have a choice. We either just don't sing or we sing something we don't mean. And so today, as we go through this series, Soundtracks, we're going to consider one of the soundtracks of ancient Israel, the soundtrack of lament. Before we step into that, however, I have to answer what might be a question in your heart and mind. I know it has been at times in my own heart and mind, and that is, so we have these times when we read Psalms that urge us to give our questions to God or to vent with God the anger that is in our hearts and souls. Does it make any difference? I'd like to read to you, with her permission, an email I received this last week. The email comes from Iris Landa, Iris was the wife of the late Paul Landa, esteemed scholar, church historian, faculty member at our sister institution down the road at La Sierra University who passed away now some years ago. Iris sent me this email this past week. Hi, Randy. Last evening, I was with a group of friends who attend LUC, and the subject came up of the sermon series about the Psalms and especially about the comments after the sermon. They resonated with me in a very personal way. I shared with the group my stories about the Psalms, and several told me I absolutely had to email you. After my husband died in 1997, I had great difficulty reading. But I do have a book entitled Psalms Now by Leslie Brandt. The only psalms I chose to read were the ones where David cries out to God. Somehow, I felt he was the one person who understood my intense grief, such as Psalm 38. Oh, God, I feel as if I were pierced through with a red-hot iron. I am falling apart, broken and spent, wretched and miserable, flat on my face in despair. Or Psalm 69. Oh God, at this time I find myself really up against the wall, at the bottom of the barrel, at the end of my rope. I can't even pray, so deep is my despair. Raise me from the mire of despair, the darkness of depression. Iris writes, one Sabbath afternoon, about 20 months after Paul died, I was feeling lonely, lost, and depressed. And I happened to think about Handel's Messiah, the mighty counselor, the Prince of Peace. This kept going through my mind. Then I exclaimed, that's it. God is the mighty counselor. I will have a counseling session with God. So I lit a candle and started in. God, this is not prayer. This is therapy. And I let God have it. I yelled at God, asked so many questions. I cried and cried and went through a box of tissues. After about an hour, I washed my face, and I knew God had heard me. I did not realize I had so much anger. And I said, okay, God, I'll have another session with you next Sabbath. The following week, I had finished venting in about a half hour. And the third week, I was thinking about what I had not told God And nothing came up. After a while, I laughed and said, Okay, God, you must be laughing with me now. That was the beginning of my healing. I was able to begin a journey to find happiness and joy. 
Yes, there are occasional times when I have an intense, angry conversation with God, and now I know I'm heard. May God grant you wisdom as you continue to speak. Abundant, joyful blessings, Iris Landa. Thank you, Iris. I will confess as I read your email, I wondered if Asaph wasn't leaning over your shoulder, giving you some directions here and there, because that's straight out of Asaph. We've heard him, haven't we? The first week, Psalm 73, venting his questions toward God. These are my questions. Here's what I'm asking. The next week, Psalm 109, white hot anger, and he's venting it on God. And then this week, we come to lament. We turn to Psalm 79. And one of the first things you'll notice when you turn to Psalm 79 is the byline. It says, a Psalm of Asaph. You got questions, Asaph says, ask God. You got anger, Asaph says, vent it to God. You have lament, we're back to Asaph. I'm starting to like Asaph. This is a man with a deeply authentic, honest relationship with God. Now, this psalm has a very specific historical context. We don't always get that with the psalms. Sometimes, in fact, most of the time, the Psalms are just beautiful or raw or honest or kind songs about what's going on in the life of ancient Israel, but we don't have their context. But there are certain ones for the context we do know we have, and this is one of those. The context is the destruction of Jerusalem in 587, 586 B.C., a horrific time in Israel's history. In fact, some Old Testament scholars say this was the most cataclysmically difficult moment in all of the Old Testament. You may see it differently, but some say that. That's the context for what's happening here. In fact, if you ever have the opportunity of being in the city of Jerusalem on a Friday afternoon or Friday evening, go to the western wall, that piece of the exposed wall that is still there, and you will see the Jewish people coming, and you will see them praying, rocking back and forth as they express their heart through different scriptural passages to God. This is one of the Psalms they recite. It grows out of that very experience. Three different sections of unequal length. We're going to read the first one now. I'll just prepare you. He is describing what happened when Jerusalem was ransacked and destroyed. Psalm 79, verse 1. O oh God, pagan nations have conquered your land, your special possession. They have defiled your holy temple and made Jerusalem a heap of ruins. They have left the bodies of your servants as food for the birds of heaven. The flesh of your godly ones has become food for the wild animals. Blood has flowed like water all around Jerusalem. No one is left to bury the dead. We are mocked by our neighbors, an object of scorn and derision to those around us. It's horrific. James Montgomery Boyce, the late, late James Montgomery Boyce, says that Psalm 74 and Psalm 79, in a sense, parallel each other. Both of them deal with the destruction of Jerusalem. But Boyce says in Psalm 74, what you get is a picture almost of the psalmist, as it were, taking God by the hand and walking him around the destroyed city and telling him what happened. God, right there, that's where they broke through the wall. And right there, that's where they lined us up and slaughtered us. And over there, that heap of stones, that's the temple that has been devastated and destroyed. God, when are you going to act and do something? Where are you? very similar in Psalm 79, except that in 74, the focus is primarily on the temple. In 79, the focus is primarily on the people. Both of them have those questions, that lament of the heart and soul. It's important that we understand just how devastating this was. So let me read to you a summary by Boyce where he points out four ways in which their lives were basically over. 
So listen to what Boyce writes. None of us has been witness to a disaster of this magnitude. Bad things happen to us sometimes. We get sick or someone close to us dies or fire destroys our home or we lose a job. But here, everything that could go wrong has gone wrong. Everything that could possibly be destroyed has been destroyed. The destruction was political because the nation no longer existed. There was no king, no counselors, no people in authority, no army. The destruction was economic because the land was devastated. No one could earn a living. There was no one to buy anything that might be produced. The destruction was social because entire families were wiped out and there was no one who had not lost a husband, son, father, mother, wife, or children in the conflict. Worst of all, the destruction was religious for there was no temple and the worship of God had ceased throughout the land. It was utter cataclysmic destruction. Nothing left. And Asaph, as it were, wanders among the ruins. And there wells up within him a lament. God, God, what has happened? Now, by recognizing the magnitude of their sorrow, We cannot, by that, minimize your or my sorrow in the present time. In a grief recovery group I led years ago, somebody made a comment kind of comparing different kind of losses, and one of the members of the group immediately spoke up and said, there can be no comparing of war wounds because grief comes only in one size, and that's extra large. It's too big for all of us. And that is the truth. So that lament you brought in your soul today may be different, but it may be your world. We do have examples of such destruction. The Christian writer Philip Yancey writes of what he saw now about 11 years ago. Shortly after Christmas 2012, he writes... I addressed the New England town of Newtown, Connecticut, a community reeling from the murder of 20 school children and six teachers and staff just days prior. An ambulance driver captured the mood in Newtown well. All of us on the fire and ambulance corps volunteers, he told me, we don't train for something like this. Nobody does. And my wife is a teacher at Sandy Hook. She knew all 20 children by name as well as the staff. After hiding out during the carnage, she had to walk past the bodies of her colleagues in the hallway. He paused to control his voice, then continued. Everyone experiences grief. Usually, though, you bear grief. You go to the grocery store, you go back to work. Eventually, the outer world takes over more of you and the grief begins to shrink. But here in Newtown, we go to the store and we see memorials to the victims. We walk down the street and we see the markers on the porches of those who lost a child. It's like a bell jar has been placed over the town with all the oxygen pumped out. We can't breathe for the grief. And that's Asaph. God, we can't breathe for the grief. So what do we do? Asaph laments. He laments to God. We're going to read it. It's the larger part of the psalm. Back to Psalm 79. I want you to notice that what he says clusters around three primary questions or statements. The question, how long? The question, why do you let them destroy us and then laugh at us? And then the plea, save us. His lament will cluster around those three realities. Psalm 79, verse 5. O Lord, How long will you be angry with us? 
forever. And by the way, remember last week, before we read more, remember last week, his unvarnished, unretouched, unedited expression to God of his anger. He is just as emotionally clear and candid and honest in this lament. So we go back now, verse five. Oh Lord, how long will you be angry with us forever? How long will your jealousy burn like fire? Pour out your wrath on the nations that refuse to acknowledge you, on kingdoms that do not call upon your name, for they have devoured your people Israel, making a land, the land a desolate wilderness. Do not hold us guilty for the sins of our ancestors. Let your compassion quickly meet our needs, for we are on the brink of despair. Help us, O God of our salvation. Help us for the glory of your name. Save us and forgive our sins for the honor of your name. Why should pagan nations be allowed to scoff, asking where is their God? Show us your vengeance against the nations, for they have spilled the blood of your servants. Listen to the moaning of the prisoners. Demonstrate your great power by saving those condemned to die. O Lord, pay back our neighbors seven times for the scorn they have hurled at you. You cannot read very far in the Psalms without being profoundly affected by the honesty that these psalmists had in their relationship with God. Here he comes, a psalm of lament, a communal psalm of lament. In fact, one Old Testament scholar, Beth Tanner, calls this a communal cry for help. Can you imagine if we came together in that fashion when we needed to do so? One of my clear memories, clear memories of our worship in this sanctuary happened the Sabbath after 9-11. 9-11 was on a Tuesday. That's the day we have staff meetings, staff worship, worship planning. We sat down at worship planning and immediately said, we can't do what we were planning to do. We cannot. We can't. And so we sat with tears in our eyes and planned a different service. And I will tell you, as we came together that day, there was in our hearts, there was in our worship, in our music, in our prayers, there was lament, communal lament. There are times when we need that as a community. There are times when we need that as individuals as we come to the worship of God. The question can be, well, why do we do that? God knows everything. God knows it all. Why do we take the time to inform him? I mean, you read Asaph. He's giving the description of what the land looks like littered with the bodies of maybe his own family. God knows that. Why are you saying that? I came across in preparing the statement of an Old Testament scholar named Jamie Grant. And I thought, maybe I can summarize what Grant says, but as I read and reread it, I thought, no, it's said very well. Even those four paragraphs, I'd like you to hear it in Grant's own words. Here's what Grant writes. Why pray when God already knows what is happening and what we need? Probably every Christian has experienced thoughts along these lines. If God knows everything and sees everything, if God is a caring father and knows what we need, why should we bring these things to him in prayer? Does he not see or is he unwilling to respond to our needs? Therein lies the error of our thinking. So much of our practice of prayer is based on, please catch this, an attitude of functionality. Functionality. We pray to get things done. We pray to accomplish something. The end of our prayers to meet the needs of others or all too often of ourselves. Prayer is the way to get things done. We have much to learn from Psalm 79 in terms of our attitude in prayer. Imagine coming home from a day at work in which you and three of your colleagues had just been fired. You decide not to say anything to your spouse because after all, there's nothing that he or she can do about it. That same day you wrecked the car, but again, do not talk to your family about what happened. Later that week, you're mugged at knife point, but once more you decide to keep the incident to yourself. The point, of course, is obvious. We talk about things with the people we love. 
At the end of each and every day, wives and husbands talk with each other about the experiences at work or their day with the kids or what has been happening in the neighborhood. Each and every day, friends chat about everything and nothing. Siblings catch up on what has been going on, their li- going on in their lives, good or bad, and parents endeavor to extract a fuller response than fine to the question of how was school? Why is it so? The truth of the matter is that people who love each other talk with each other about their lives. Did the psalmist believe that God had been asleep when Jerusalem fell and the temple was destroyed? No. Did he think that perhaps it had slipped God's mind? No. Did he perhaps believe that God was not really very interested in the plight of his people? No. So why remind God of these events? People who love each other talk with each other about the things that are important to them. It is what we do. Prayer is about more than getting things done. It is about relationship with the Father who loves us and whom we love. So we talk about all the stuff in our lives, the big things and the little things. We talk about things as we see them and we let God shape us to see things from his perspective. We pray as an expression of love, not as a means to an end. That is why we pray even when God already knows. Because we talk to the people we love about the things that are going on in our lives. Good, bad, easy, hard. Reminds me of my favorite statement about prayer from the pen of Ellen White. One sentence. Prayer is the opening of the heart to God as to a friend. So if you experience the, the, the destruction of your marriage, do you talk to your friend about it? If you have a great financial reversal, do you share that with your friends? If you get an awful, a, a devastating diagnosis and aren't sure there's a way forward, do you process that with your friends? That's what Asaph is doing. He is coming before God at the most cataclysmic destruction that his people have ever experienced and saying, God, how long? Why? Save us. It's his lament to God. Honest, candid, unvarnished. So where does that lead? What comes from that? I want to read you the last section, which is really just the last verse of the psalm, Psalm 79. I want you to remember what has led up to this, a graphic description of what happened, a candid discussion of what's going on in Asaph's and his community's soul, and then this. Then we, your people, the sheep of your pasture, will thank you forever and ever praising your greatness from generation to generation. I wonder if maybe the most important word, the most important word is that verse, in that verse might not be the word then. Then. Not now. Right now I'm unloading all of this. This is where I am. But in the process of that, apparently Asaph has come to a recognition that this isn't the last word. That the story does not end with his lament. But that now there's a light at the end of the tunnel. That one day, then, that the people, the community, including Asaph, will be able to praise God. To worship God for what God has done. Now, when I read that, I wonder, what is it that gets Asaph to that point? What is it that allows him to have that conviction? And I wonder, if we take Psalm 79 and lay it alongside another Old Testament passage, if we might not find the answer. So there is another Old Testament person, we believe it was Jeremiah, 
who also wrote about this same event, the destruction of Jerusalem. He too laments. In fact, his laments are so powerful and so profound and so long that it's like Psalm 79 on steroids. His lament, in fact, make up an entire book called Lamentations. Lamenting is so biblical, we even have a book named after it, Lamentations. And there in that book, if you read what Jeremiah says, you will never accuse Jeremiah of being a starry-eyed idealist. You will never accuse him of being in denial. Jeremiah understands and knows and recognizes the utter devastation that has occurred and the pain, the searing pain that he and his people experience. And yet, in spite of all that, right at the heart of Lamentations is a passage. Right at the heart. There's lament leading up to it. There's lament moving away from it. But right at the heart is something that continues to sustain Jeremiah and I believe continues to sustain Asaph as they face the very same event. Here's the passage. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 19. The thought of my suffering and homelessness is bitter beyond words. I will never forget this awful time as I grieve over my loss. Yet I still dare to hope when I remember this. The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. I say to myself, the Lord is my inheritance, therefore I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who depend on him, to those who search for him. So it is good to wait quietly for salvation from the Lord. Wow. So you have Asaph saying, the day will come, then... We will worship God together. And you have Jeremiah saying, in the midst of everything that has happened, there's one thing to which I cling. One thing I confess. Great is thy faithfulness. O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with you. Thou changest not thy compassions. They fail not. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Do you realize how they're surviving? They're surviving because they have hold two realities in tension with each other. On the one hand is the reality of their lament, of their suffering. They don't duck around it. They don't hide from it. They don't sugarcoat it. They are candid and true and honest and real. This is my lament, God. This is where I am. But on the other hand, they have the faithfulness of God. The fact that they have that hope that says the day will come when it will be set right, when God's faithfulness will be shown. And they hold those two realities in tension. You realize if you drop one of those, you're in trouble, right? If you drop your lament, then you come with a plastic smile on your face and sing praises you don't mean. So you have to hold on to that. But if you drop the faithfulness of God, then you descend into a darkness in which there is no light. So Asaph and Jeremiah hold the two in tension. Both are true. I have profound lament, God, and here it is. And I can do that, God, because you are faithful. And one day, then, according to Asaph, one day we will fully know your faithfulness. So we've come this morning, come to worship, but we've come with laments in our souls. As the music plays, I want us all to look at the screen and get a feel 
for the laments of the worshipers with whom we worship. Gracious God, we come with many laments in our heart. Broken relationships, sorrow over the deaths of loved ones, sadness at the condition of the world, of the country. Or we come to present those to you in honesty, in truth. We come casting ourselves upon you. Lord, let us have the courage to be more honest in our prayers with you. And then, Lord, give us a deeper faith to see, to understand, and to hold to your faithfulness. Lord, here we are, your people. Save us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, I'd like to ask you to ponder your own heart in candor as the music plays. <laughs> 